Okay, so um, we're back. We've, I've tried to arrange, so you can see me now. I've Britons and I can mm. wave at you and, and I've now set it up so I can see you as well, so things seem to be a wee bit better now. Okay, so um, workflows. You guys are, are at the point where um, we were, as Rena was discussing, uh, for the Glide people, I've created this particular work, work, workflow. Um, so in Jira, you'll find that when you create an issue, it goes directly into open. Okay? Um, and then from, from open, I can actually, like there are transitions into uh, in progress and then grand transitions into blocks and transitions back into um, in progress and into in review and then resolved and finished um, or done. So anything, like if there is a workflow that you would prefer, we can take you through the Jira, work, Jira workflow description and actually change both the names of the stages and the names of the transitions. And what the names of the transitions do is that in Jira, when you go to change state, it will say, like, close. And that's actually put it on this transition from resolved to finished. There is a word that you can put on that transition, and that will show up in the, in the um, workflow. But the idea, the idea is that you don't do this as a team. What happens is you have someone in your organization who is a software configuration manager, and that manager decides what the workflows are. You, as an individual, don't do that, and you as a group don't do that. It's your configuration manager who says, we as a business, this is the way we work, and so this is how you will process your tasks. Um, now, those have, you can set up the stages, you can set up the transitions, uh, you can even create um, certain transitions that only certain people can do, right? So it can actually have permissions on certain transitions. And so it may be that you as a developer do not have authority to move something into finish, right? Just because you don't see that as a button on your system. Um, and so we can set up all of these constraints around workflows. With the pre-commit hooks, one of the things we can also set up, if you're wanting us to do this, um, is to set up a pre-commit hook in your Git that will prevent you from committing a message that does not have an issue associated. Right? So what it does is it parses the, the um, commit message and it goes, wait a minute, that commit message does not comply to our standards as a group, therefore you cannot commit using that message, which means you then have to add uh, an issue to that. Um, you can also get a, an overview. Um, we can also set up things like swim lanes, uh, and you can see various diagrams. Um, swim lanes are usually around, you know, we can set them around either milestones or around ethics or around some feature of your issues. And what that does is for your boards, so for your, your issue boards, where you go from um, open to like in the backlog where you put them into the sprint to be done, so it's a to-do column, in progress, in review, resolved, um, you can actually have lanes. So there's a line across the top and a line across the bottom. And so you can have like a back end and front end lanes. And so you don't get all the issues locked up together. You have two lanes which are resolved by the tag that they're part of, um, or the epic that they're part of, or the person they're assigned to. So as part of your development process, you can decide how you want to see your boards and how you want to see those issues. And this is all part of kind of communicating and setting up your environment to help you. Uh, at the end of each sprint, we'll, um, we're going to see things like this. Did people do a burn down chart, really? Not yet? No. No. So, we got there. Yeah. The, 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 the I'm starting to make yeah. any. Yeah. This, yeah, yeah, so uh, that way. Um, that burn down chart, <laughs> so I heard you work out which way that point. <laughs> that burn down chart is something that looks um, awesome and is pretty close to a really good burn down chart, even though in the last few weeks it looks a bit strange. Um, most of you will probably generate the burn down chart that goes horizontal for quite a long time and then steps down a long way and then maybe steps up a long way and then goes flat for a while, and then gets halfway down, and then stuff. 
Um, so it will look bad initially. Um, you also have to get used to the idea of, of um, estimating the hours. So this is this is all story points. So and this will be estimating story points before you add the issue to your sprint. Because as soon as you add the issue to your sprint, the burn down chart starts counting. If you then add an estimate, you add the issue with the zeros, and you go, well, I actually think this is going to be five point. Suddenly, your burn down chart will go jump up because your estimate has changed from being unknown to being five. So, so estimate all your issues before you put them into a sprint. And then put them, when you put them in the sprint, you'll get this, this start high and track down. You also want to make your issues small enough so that they can be being resolved within a day or two. Right? Um, you don't want to wait a week before you see any progress because then you get these big chunks and it's very hard to track. Um, here, it also has non-working days. You don't have to use non-working days. We can actually set you up and say, well, no. All days can be working days, um, or not. It, it's entirely up to you. What that actually does in terms of the graph here is that the gray, the gray lines in there, the, the, the gray vertical bars, they assume that no um, commits and no 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 um, issues will be resolved during weekend. Um, that might not be realis realistic for you, um, and so you could use a, a, a seven day working week. And then it will just generate a nice smooth line all the way down. Um, you might have fewer done during weekends, but it might not be zero. You know? So you can adjust the way that looks. And that's that's all about plan. Now, um, the second half of what I was supposed to talk about um, was code reviews. Uh, now, I know the students who did. So, so how many of you guys did um, my professional programming course? So I've got, I've got one, I can see another elbow going up. <laughs> so about half? Less than half, one third. Less than half, okay. So, so unfortunately for you guys, a lot of this is repetition because, you know, um, that's that's just what happens sometimes when you come into a new master's program and a bunch of people didn't do the same degree as you. Um, okay, so code reviews are critical to improving the quality of your code. Um, one of the things I talk about in the professional programming course is that we call programming languages languages because they're about communicating. Part of that communication is showing your code to other people. And when you write code, your code should help the person who's trying to debug your code understand what the code does. So instead of writing code just as, for, oh, no one will see this, so it'll happen, you have to be thinking, okay, this, the team members will see this. Right? This is me doing my best effort. Right? So I want to write reasonably quality code. Um, it also means that when you've got particular problems, someone coming in with a different perspective might actually be able to give you a, a better feedback. Um, on those problems. So, so giving a code review and getting other people to help you with the problems is very useful. So it allows you to check those errors. It allows you to improve the quality of the code you write because when you write, it may be perfectly clear to you, but not clear to other people. And if other people are going to have to debug your code, your code needs to be clear to them as well. So Getting someone to look at it from a different perspective improves the quality of your code in terms of maintainability, debugging. Um, also, although you might agree on a kind of a coding standard, it's not until you look at each other's code that you can check, am I actually following the coding standard or just, right? And so um, when you want to integrate code and you're using naming convention, it's not until people review your code and say, oh, no, no, but that should be called that. And you go, oh, okay, so that's what we meant with that convention. Right? So just just seeing something on paper isn't enough to get you to actually get it right um, all the time. And we also want to use reuse versus one-time code. So 
Um, if you are reviewing one-time code that is a prototype you claim to throw away, then you're not looking at it from the point of view of is this code itself good enough? It's is the idea that is implemented good enough? Right? Um, and so with code reviews, um, they're quite, quite time consuming. Um, and so uh, in the program we usually just afternoon, but when you do a code review, you have a bunch of people all sort of working on the same piece of code. And so you're putting a lot of, of, of material, of, of your actual kind of time commitment to development into improving the quality of one small bit of code. So you want to remove as many of the easily found issues as possible. And so you want to automate that. Um, so Sonar Cloud is a way of doing it. Um, automated tools, so linters, all of those are quite good at checking a bunch of standard things. So you should certainly look to find a system that allows you to automate and check a whole bunch of things about your code. Linting is, is the first layer of that. Um, continuous integration, CI, to check you're not getting any bugs. Um, having code standards that you can check against. Um, static anal analysis, all of those are quite useful. Um, also, I, um, one of the things that we can do, which we've done in the past, is get the um, Information Security Masters here to come in and give you guys a security review. Um, I believe that, that they still have one of their projects, they're supposed to review some code um, and do a security review. So um, what we could do is we could actually try and link them with the Security master and have them come and review your code for you and find all the big security vulnerabilities. Um, if you're doing processing any user data, if you're keeping any um, significant information, um, security and privacy are big issues. Um, the GDPR, which you should all be well aware of by now, um, is coming through and any software that maintains information that any user did in has to have a security audit on it. So this is going to become standard practice on all commercial products in Europe. Right? So um, we might as well start that early-ish. Um, so start thinking about having a security person will come in and will audit your code and they'll and the easier you make your code to, to read, the faster that audit will go. And if you make your code complex and hard to read, you're paying a lawyer for much, much longer. And that's not a good idea, right? So you don't you don't want to have lawyers auditing your code and taking forever understand it. So we really do need to write code to understand. So some tips around your code reviews. Um, I recommend doing code reviews. You should all be doing code reviews. Um, I would set aside some time at least once a week to have a look at some uh, each other's line of code. You don't need to review every line of code that everyone writes. Um, well, again, depends on your company. Some companies require every line of code that goes into final production to have been read by one other person, right? So they, they have a strict requirement that you never put into production lines of code that only ever been seen by one other. Um, we don't really have that luxury, I don't think. Um, so the idea is that you shouldn't be doing a, a more than four lines of code per session because you're, it, it starts to become a bit of a blur and it's hard to remember all the lessons that you learned um, if you do more than four hundred. Um, no more than, than an hour at a time. So um, don't do a code review on one piece of code for more than an hour. The person trying to fix that code will have got too many issues to fix after an hour of, of work, you don't want to add more. Um, set goals and capture metric. Um, so when you do a code review, be specific with the person that you're doing the review of what you're trying to do and how you're going to measure improvements. Right? Because they, they can't just say, oh, make it better. Right? Better code doesn't make sense. You want to make it efficient or I'm looking to resolve this bug because of the usability issues. Um, I want to check my coding standards, or like what is the objective and how are you going to measure it? Um, 
before you get to the code review, spend a bit of time annotating your code to make it easier to review. That annotation, annotation will also make it easier to debug later. So you're not just wasting time there, you're actually doing something very good. Um, if you've never done it before, there are a bunch of checklists. I've given you a whole bunch of resources in the conference page, um, which also give you checklists about how to do code reviews. Um, and one of the things that I talked about in my professional programming course is, is that that's an attitude course. Professionalism is an attitude rather than a particular skill. Um, and often in code reviews, your attitude towards the review Will, infect, will influence how effective that review is. If you go in there hating the team member that you're working with and just wanting to rubbish their code and tell them how shit they are at developing stuff, then they're going to get the idea that you think they're shit at developing stuff and they're, going to get, they're more likely to be, well, well, screw you, I'm just going to do it the way I want to do it, and your whole code review falls apart, and there's no problem. So if you go in with a very negative attitude, it may be that you destroy the value of your review. It has to be working together to improve, rather than I'm just pointing out all the shitty code you write. Right? So, so try and remain positive, and try and look at it as a way of improving both me as a person being reviewed, I want to get better, and you want to help. It's a positive coaching kind of experience. Um, and formal reviews, I'm not suggesting you do formal reviews each week, where you actually have like a checklist with 16 different items you're going to check off on each single line of code. Um, just scanning through each other's code quite often can be very, very useful. Um, as I said, we, we want security reviews. We want to check against standard monitoring. Um, if you can, get people to test your code um, and think about privacy and data storage. Uh, it may seem silly to you to worry about it, but if you're ever working commercially now, it's a 20 million euro fine for getting it wrong. So, um, yeah, it can destroy your company if it's a small company. So you, you just don't want to get it wrong. Um, you want to make sure authentication is handled properly. You want to, to have auditing and logging of behavior in the system so you can see what's happening. And you're going to have to think about encryption of data. Right? Um, you've already seen this with HTTP. Uh, we've now pretty much entirely gone to HTTPS. Uh, it certainly makes handwriting um, web pages harder and handwriting, building your own web server. Like you used to be able to do this relatively easily with, the, with a bit of JavaScript and a bit of some C code. Um, now, yeah, you want to have SSH encoding and it's going to be, be encrypted and it's going to be hard work. So you don't do it by hand anymore. You, you use them um, in, in Nginx. You, you use those things because we need security. Um, and GDPR. Is a big deal. Refactoring code. In a code review, um, one of the things you can ask someone to do is to refactor some code because it's become too big, too complex. Um, however, when do you do a refactor? Um, because refactoring improves your code but adds no features. Right? So you're, you're what you can show us as customers in your weekly review, if you've refactored all your code, all your code looks much better, but your end product looks identical to what it did before. Right? And so it feels like you're making no progress. Um, luckily, we are very sympathetic product owners. Um, you can show us code and we can go, mm -hmm, I can see that that code is now much better for the dog. Right? Whereas normal product owners will go, well, I don't know. Why, like, why haven't you got new things? You spent another four weeks developing, and it's exactly what it looked like four weeks ago. What's going on? Have, like, have you been out partying before? Um, and so code reviews are, are very much a challenge when you go to lead to refactor. Um, you have to do a cost-benefit analysis. Some people just don't refactor parts of their code, not because it wouldn't be better, but because they just 
it's not worth the time. Um, now, when you push back fixing things, um, we call that technical debt. No? Every time you find things that should be improved in your code and go, I'll, I'll, I'll do it later, we consider that debt. That's some cleanup in the future that will be done by someone else. Um, refactoring pays back that debt. It cleans up those things that you've been pushing back. Um, unfortunately, technical debt is one of those things that can screw a project as the, the, the amount of refactoring required keeps getting pushed back and back and back to the point where you get a block of code and you go, God, we can't touch this. We're going to have to throw the whole lot away, start again from scratch. Right? Um, you see this with Unity as you delay updating Unity. So you say, oh, we'll, we'll use 5.1. And we won't move to, to Unity 17.1. And we won't move to Unity 17.2. And we won't move to 18.2 because we want to stay with this. You're now getting further and further behind the current Unity. And at some point, if they stop supporting your version, most of your code now has to be trashed because it's so far behind the current Unity. Right? So that's a, a debt that you've built to the point where it's been foreclosed and you've lost the whole project that has to start again. So there's kind of constant balance between those two. And you'll have to talk about that with us, even during this semester with um, I also said I'd talk about design patterns. Why I include design patterns in code reviews is because one of the ways of communicating in code, and one of the things you can do when you're looking at reviewing other people's solutions, is understanding the standard solution. So if you use design patterns, then you're following standard solutions. So it's easier for people to review what you've done and give you feedback, because they, they can see, oh yeah, I can see that's a, a standard design pattern. It's a standard singleton, it's a, it's a model view controller pattern. So it's a standard pattern that you're following. And so it's faster to review and it's easier to understand. Um, now, you guys have all done design patterns before? I've got some nods. Yeah, I, I, design patterns are relatively standard. Um, when you're doing code reviews, do try and check with each other that you do understand um, the same, like the, the design patterns in the same way, right? So if I quickly go through, so basically, when you're looking at your design patterns, um, identifying annotating when you're using a particular pattern will help you in the review process. Uh, it also makes it faster for, for you to find the errors and find other errors. So um, we make a distinction between programming patterns and usability patterns. So um, given you guys are both having interfaces and programming, you can look at, most of you would have done programming design patterns around singleton and factories and those sort of things. There are also usability patterns where you start saying, okay, uh, these are standard ways of building interfaces user. So for our design patterns, I'll just skip through these seeing I assume all of you have them. So I just got some slides here that went through command, flyweight, singleton, strategy, factor, position, and composition. Right? So these were a bunch of standard patterns in programming. Um, these ones also, um, the last couple quite useful again, but they're, they're fairly standard patterns. So, so what you should look at when you think about design patterns, when you think, I've got this problem, right? How do I remap the function call from inputs? So you say, okay, what's the the, the standard pattern for this? Right? So you should, you should think, every time you have a problem, has someone else had this problem? Um, and is there a standard solution? Because if I can use the standard solution, other people will understand it better. So you use a flyweight pattern, where you, you actually say, okay, rather than storing all of the material in every object, I create a lightweight object, a heavyweight object, a heavyweight object contains all the code and all the complexity, and then I have late lightweight instances which all only store just enough, right? So if you've got particle systems or you've got a, a system where you've got thousands of an object, but you only want um, each individual to have a very small difference from the core, then you use a flyweight pattern. Um, and this is so the example is, is if you have trees, rather than having every object with all of its information, you have just the position of each tree and you have a large model. 
So, so when you're programming, rather than storing necessarily every object separate, you actually think, okay, can can I store a template and then just have the variation? Um, the singleton pattern. Some people hate the singleton pattern. Some people call it an anti-pattern um, because it's potentially a terrible way of instantiating things, but the basic idea is a bit like Git and like the Jira workflow, is you're trying to create a standard way of creating an object, and so you remove the ability of a programmer to use new to create the object, and so it's basically saying, no, you don't have authority to create memory, I'm going to handle that in my single right? So it's again creating a workflow around the program. And you have various checklists for single time. Um, strategy patterns, where uh, you're using objects and you're replacing strategies, so you're kind of using an object level um, swap and the object pointers to change what things do. Uh, and so there's an get I'll, I'll put all these slides up, that's why I'm, I'm skipping through them. If you want to go and have a look at them, you can go and have a look at your strategy pattern. Um, and the factory pattern, if you're dealing with memory in your system, knowing where though the memory is being created and and um, because anytime you're creating and removing memory it's going to slow your system down uh, and so if you can do that all in one place then you're more likely to be able to find errors and speed up problems speed up the the, the resolution of those problems um, you can also look at how you reuse memory for yourself rather than the operating system to deal with um, and so there's, there's both concrete factories and abstract factories, to give you an example, an abstract tree, and uh, without an abstract class, so we have a, a concrete tree. Though a concrete factory does sound like it's a huge concrete. No, it's just conceptual. Um, and the composite pattern is the idea that you're, you're, if you're, um, you've got the problem of, of how do I create um, Related iteration through and managing a related, but with a lot of things that are similar, then I need to have some way of, of storing and indexing and accessing all of that. And so the composite pattern is the idea that you you arrange the objects in the tree structure um, and you represent parts and whole um, architecture and hierarchies. Right? So you, you, you can then treat, so one of the ones they do with this is a picture, and a picture can contain some primitive leaf objects. Or other pictures, right? So you have this composite. Now, identifying that that's what you're doing again allows the review process to work more easily. So here, example, there's the standard graphic object can have a drawer, an add, a remove, and a get child, and it could have lines, rectangles, textures as native things, and then um, it could in and include a whole new picture, and so you get this hierarchy of things. And that's a sort of composite. You build things up of primitives, and then they can have primitives and another whole object added to it in a highlight. Um, now, those are all kind of design patterns, and you can see this kind of hierarchy being created. Um, the, the following pattern is, is good in some ways, particularly when it helps people understand um, what what your code is doing. It helps you spot errors because if you've done something unusual in the pattern, it's easier. Um, and it leaves your thinking to the unique problems of your code. So uh, one of the things you don't want to do is, is spend your time thinking about stuff that's easily set. You want to you want to know what's unique about what you're doing and focus on that interesting bit rather than the boiler pad stuff. Following patterns can be bad, particularly if you choose the wrong pattern, or your problem doesn't fit the pattern, and so you change your understanding of your problem to be what works for the, the pattern. Um, one of the nicest or worst examples of this is um, using um, the uh, tail recursion on the um, uh, Fibonacci numbers, right? Because you know, like Fibonacci, you, you, you guys know the Fibonacci numbers and 1, 1, 3, 5, 8, 13, and going up like that, right? And often it's used as an example of recursion because it 
is easy to define in recursion. Recursion is a terrible way of generating the Fibonacci numbers, and you should never do it that way, because you don't need to do it that way, and recursion is incredibly expensive for that sequence of numbers. Okay? But those numbers are a good way of showing off recursion data. Recursion is not a good way of generating those numbers. Okay? So understand the difference between those two. So an example may be a good way of showing off a pattern, but it might not be that that pattern is the best way of doing that example. Right? So kind of understanding the difference between those two. And when you get that wrong, you say, well, you know, they, they showed this problem as, and this was the pattern that my lecturer used for this problem, so that's what I used. That may be because that was a good way of showing off the pattern, not a good solution to the problem. Right? So you've really got to watch out there with that with patterns because often the way people teach a pattern is not by showing them how they're best used, but by using examples that show off the pattern. So it's a it's a it's a, a tricky thing sometimes. Also, if you're using a pattern, you may be showing faith in a system which might not be the best way of doing things. Right? So people will say, oh, this is the pattern, this is where we solve. That might not be the best way of solving your problem. But because someone else has told you it's a good idea, you have faith in it, and so you follow it to the letter without thinking about why, and you end up with a terrible mess of code that you don't understand because you haven't created that solution. You've just cut and pasted someone else's solution from a Stack Overflow um, article you found, and you've pasted it in, it vaguely works, you got the front bit right, you got the end bit right, the bit in the middle, eh, um, and then something breaks and you don't know how to fix it and you don't know where the problem is and it's not. Right? So sometimes following patterns and certainly copying and pasting other people's patterns just because of the pattern isn't going to be your best way of reviewing your code. Okay? Now, what I had actually thought I would do um, at the end of the session, because that was my last slide, um, because I, want, I, I was wanting to kind of have some session, some time to look at Jira and to look at um, some of those issues and connecting repositories. Now, it appears that Marish has been able to connect uh, Jira to the Blind project. Is that true, Marish? Yeah, that's correct, although it hasn't been indexed yet. So the, the indexing seems to be queuing for the last you know, hour. Right. <laughs> and hopefully we'll update at some point. Yeah. Um, so, the, the idea is that what we were going, or what I was hoping to do, is actually talk you through and, and discuss with people either online and, and this board do that later, or you can discuss with Marish how you want your workflows to look like, what your challenges are, um, and getting the um, Jira stuff integrated with your, your smart commits. Now, um, if you're going to use Jira smart commits. Uh, one of the things we also have uh, as a, a Jira plugin, and I have uh, into Jira on this machine, uh, and I don't know if this is the best way of doing it, but would that crash out to something? Or, ha, huh. oh, yes. Um, so if I go there and go there, Ooh, I won't have it in here, will I? Um, because this is great for the machine, uh, my machine. Um, so <laughs> it's under slash tracker. And she's doing it in the region. Right, here it is staying up. Um, so, when you're in save time, when you're doing your smart commits, it will take a wee time, a bit of time for it to update, but it certainly pulls all those things together and puts them into to one place. And so um, it, it is very useful. Now, some of you probably don't like command line. Who or don't like um, GUI? And some of you don't like command line. Who doesn't like GUI? Who's a command line only person? Okay, we've got <laughs> So, we'll talk. So um, one of the things we've added to as a as a tool in um, Jira, and for some reason it's not the updating problem, um, 
is command line interface. Now, partly the command line interface for Jira allows you to automate all of the things you would do in the GUI in command line and in scripts. So it allows you to connect to Jira and do uh, open issues and update issues and add comments to issues and all of those things that you would normally do in the, in the GUI, you can actually do from command line using command line interface tool, right? So we have given you that option, um, but I'm not sure why my Firefox is not showing the Jira dashboard. Maybe the Jira is working so hard on indexing that um, repository that it's actually slowed down the entire server and now it doesn't know how to grab the images off. We might have to talk to, to um, Lars Eric about getting us up an extra um, CPU for the Prod3 system, mm. uh, for the DMI MT. So, um, remember what my username and password is. Um, and if any of you were very clever, you'd be able to um, work out from the sound of my keystrokes which keys I'm pressing. Um, are any of you doing security and able to do that? Yep. With the microphone, should be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's the microphone just there. It should be able to, to hear and remember. Um, I'm either that one or I'm that one. Because I'm different usernames on different systems. So, um, At least you're not typing your password in the username field. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that would kind of be a unfortunately a bit obvious. Um, so, here's to be connected. Um, and, and given you're recording it, it would then be recorded. And everybody <laughs> um, I know. It, it's, not, it's not uncommon to find some people with that. Um, okay, so, so I, you guys are seeing my Jira? And seeing that it's having problems loading? Yes, we do. It may be... Okay. Uh, Block or something that's doing this. You block the oh. matrix or something that you have running. Blocks oh, the okay. So, well, uh, this is just a, a, a fresh download of Firefox. So, I haven't configured it in any way. I'm just downloading it like 10 minutes before we started. Um, but, yes, that's. Still seems to be wanting to load. It may be that my streaming back course is, is stressing the system too much, so it's it's just tying out on the, the data transfer. Um, but I suppose one of the questions I what I wanted to do if I didn't get in was actually ask you guys questions about what you find challenging about code and version control. Do you have a branching strategy you decide or is there a, a particular challenge that you've got with using smart commits? Until you start using them, you often won't see the benefit of it. You'll think, oh, it's just overheard and it's annoying. Um, hopefully, and, and Jira is a lot of overhead. Admit that now, that Jira does feel heavyweight for what we're doing. Um, my main advice around it is it's a bit like putting um, soccer cones up and asking them to dribble around the soccer cone. Because, no, the soccer cones will not stop you, and no, the problem is too simple to require you to dribble around the cone. Um, and you could just kick past them and score a goal. When you have real problems with real teams of 20, 30, 100, 200 developers, you are going to need these tools. Right? You're going to need tools which allow you to do all of this training. And at that point, you'll start seeing some of the benefit of a, of a full issue tracking system with full data on your record. We're going to make you do it this time just so you get that experience, and then you have the knowledge to choose whether to use this system in the future, right? um, or whether to just use GitLab's issue tracking, or or GitHub issue tracking and saying, well, that's enough. 
plus Trello is enough for us to do that. Right? So, so this is partly, this first project is about giving you choices for the rest of your master's thesis. Um, rather than saying, this is the best tool for a project this summer. Right? Does that, that make sense? So, um, have you guys got any questions? No. Um, uh, okay, well, I, if you haven't got questions, Marish and I can set you up with Jira. Marish, they might come, want to come over. Yep. Yeah, so Marish, if you can help them set up with their, their Jira, I know July. Um, I added a couple of issues to the Jira project. This is Glide 1 and Glide 2. I saw you guys commenting on those issues, so thank you for that. Um, hopefully, we should be able to show you a smart commit. I will. I connected up um, the Glide project to one of my projects, um, so my my is checking up to the uh, 4888 um, re repo, which you can have multiple repos connected. Um, and so I'll push there to see if I can get uh, a link between an issue and a commit message so I can show you that. But you can do that with, with, with Marish and you can go and have a look at the Glide repository and you can see, see kind of how some of the smart commits are working. Once you get smart commit working, it does start to become easier to understand what's going on and, and, and um, easier to use them once you standardize the way of committing. Yeah, so Jira says indexing is failing for some repositories. Please alert your Jira administrator. <laughs> and if you check all the logs, they say no errors, no errors. It's just not <laughs> it's just not indexing, so for some reason. Um but um you should missing token. Okay. Retry operation. So apparently I had So Jira has some issues, yeah. In general, okay. Um, it was working fine earlier today for me when I was updating things. So um, we'll have to see what some of those issues are, um, and I'll have to try and work out why that's working. But um, we'll we will get Jira working, and we we'll, even if we have to reinstall things, um, I'm sure Lars Eric and, and, and Marish and I can get that done. Um, the main thing, and I think Runa and Stifty would, would say this too, as well, is document what you're doing and and be able to talk about the challenges and the process and the, because if you just turn up to us and say, Oh yeah, no, we did a bunch of work and we say, Well, there yeah. and you say, Oh no, no, we didn't we like it's 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 there now and it's kind of yeah, but what was the process? How did you get to where you are? And say, Oh, um no, we did work hard and you have well when and how do we know this is your work rather than something you just grabbed off the internet? Right? We want you to document what you're doing. Uh, we want you to be honest with us because if you, sh you you tell us that you've achieved a whole bunch of things you haven't achieved, our expectations will have increased about what you'll be able to do in the next sprint. So do not lie to us at the end of a sprint. That's a terrible, terrible thing to do. You need to be telling us the truth. You need to say, this is the state we're at. We didn't achieve these things. Um, they've been pushed back to our next sprint. Do not pretend that you've got things done. Right? That's that's the worst thing you can do in this at, at this point in, in, in this in, in your education and, and your work for these these projects is to pretend to us that you've got more work done than you have actually done, because you will break our expectations and then we, you will fail the course because. We have expected more of you than you're able to be because you lied to us about what you're currently achieving after the end of each break. So don't do that to yourselves. Be honest from the first week, and things will go much, much smoother, and you'll learn a lot more. Okay? So, um, with that, I will hand you back over to Marish and Rina and Dipti. Is there anything else you need, Dipti or Marish? No, we're good. No, you're good. Okay, I will go and see if my children are asleep. <laughs> <laughs>
So it's it's at age twenty now. So um, hopefully they're they're lying down trying first things. Okay. Well, good night, everyone, and mm -hmm. hopefully I'll have a proper week. Meet it for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay.